Lord, we ask for your blessings to continue to be bestowed upon this country. We ask you to continue to bless the United States of America. We know that your word says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We continue to lift your name up and we ask for your blessings upon our land. We are a grateful and a thankful people today. And uh, we honor you for all the blessings you have given to us. We recognize that it has all come from you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, you may be seated. Uh, I know the quality wasn't that great, but I gotta tell you, it's just the best rendition ever, ever sung, hands down. It's just my opinion. But uh, hey, just before we get into this word, I wanna do one other thing. I just got a text a few moments ago while we were in service of one of our younger members of Freedom Church watching service online. This is from Asiel and Isabel Valdez's home. This is little Leo. Uh, can you play that for me? This is him watching service just a few minutes ago. I guess you could. You may have to turn your head that way. <laughs> okay. I, I just sent it to the guys just a second ago, so we didn't have a chance to get it formatted just right. But Nathan sent me that. Uh, video of his little brother worshiping with us just a few minutes ago. I thought that's so cool. Uh, I'm glad that you're able to watch online. I know that uh, all the COVID concerns are real and some people are ready to come to church. Some aren't. Uh, some want to wear your mask. Some don't. That's fine. You do what's best for you and your family. But thank you so much, whether you're watching online or you're here today. Thank you for being here today. There's no doubt we're facing some of the most in different times of our lives. To just call it negative doesn't really do it justice. Just indifferent, confusing times that we're facing today. How do we stay positive in the midst of such negative times? We're still facing all of the corona, what I call corona craziness, the economic challenges, the racial tensions, the religious freedoms under attack. Some states are declaring you can't even sing if you're in church or recite mass in the Catholic church. Uh, religious freedoms under attack, the lives of the unborn becoming less and less protected. We're living in extremely negative times. How do we remain positive? I want us to look at the Word of God, and we're going to look at what the Apostle Paul taught to the Philippians. Now, this series, I, I implore you, be with me for the next four weeks. We're going to take each chapter of Philippians, chapter one, two, three, and four, the next four weeks, and I'm going to share, share with you what I believe is a very uh, comparable uh, address that Paul made to the Philippians that's pertinent to us today. Uh, he's writing this letter to the Philippians as a prisoner under house arrest, chained to a Roman soldier uh, for nearly two years. He writes this letter back to this young infant church in the city of Philippi. And if you remember the story of Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16, whenever they are chained inside that jail and uh, they begin to sing at the midnight hour. And while they're singing, all of a sudden an earthquake happens and the prison doors are opened and the shackles fall off of their hands and feet. And when the prison guard finally wakes up and gets up and the dust clears, he's afraid that the prisoners have escaped. So he's going to kill himself because he knows that he will be killed for allowing the prisoners to escape. And just as he's getting ready to take his own life, Paul and Silas says, wait, 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 wait. Don't, don't kill yourself. We're all still here. We haven't gone anywhere. We're still here. And Paul ends up leading that prison guard to salvation in Jesus Christ and his entire household. That becomes one of the founding members of this young Philippian church. That's one of the first families. And so Paul is writing back to this Philippian church. And I want us to take just a moment just to kind of ease our way through this first chapter because I think it's important for us to grasp what is happening then and how it relates to us today. Paul and Timothy, verse number one, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. Being thankful and grateful, a key to staying positive. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. I'm gonna talk about that in just a minute. Because of your partnership in the gospel, from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. 
Then he said, it is right for me to feel this way about you since I have you in my heart, whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel. All of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And then he prays a beautiful prayer. And he said, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more. And that's what we need a whole lot more of in our world today, that the love of Jesus would abound more and more, that it would just emanate from every single one of us in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best. When God's love increases in your life, you'll be able to discern what's best, what's right. And that you may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, what's happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. He's taking a positive approach here to a very negative situation. This is actually turned around for good. He said, as a result, it's become clear through the whole palace garden to everyone else. I'm in chains for Christ. They know I'm here because of my faithfulness to Jesus. And he said, and because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Now look at this, verse 15. He said, it's true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry. Notice that, out of envy. What is envy? When you want something that somebody else has. Envy and rivalry when you're putting two groups against each other, when you're forcing people to have a rivalry, a fight against each other. He said, but others out of goodwill. So he draws a distinction between those who are preaching out of envy and rivalry and those who are preaching out of goodwill. He says, the latter, those who preach out of goodwill, they do it out of love. This is the right way. Knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. He said, I'm gonna defend this gospel. I'm gonna point out what's right and I'm gonna point out what's wrong. That's what I'm doing today. He said the former, meaning those who preach out of uh, envy and rivalry, the former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. So he's drawing a clear distinction. And I'm gonna do my best to draw a clear distinction between two messages that are being heard in our world today. And he goes on, he says, but what does it matter? The important thing is either way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. He chooses to remain positive. Yes, I will continue to rejoice. And he says, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body whether by life, by life or by death. He said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. What shall I choose? I don't know. Anybody ever find yourself in these crazy times saying, Lord, you can just take me on home. I'd be fine with that. That's kind of what Paul's saying here. He said, you know, it'd be better for me to be with Christ. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, but it's necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. But pay attention to this right here. Key verse in this passage. Whatever happens, whatever happens in this world today, whatever happens in our culture today, whatever happens at school, whatever happens this summer, whatever happens with elections, whatever happens with all of the conflict that's going on in our world today, Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Whatever happens, we have an obligation to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Are you hearing me? Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I'll know, this is great, that you stand firm in the one spirit. It sounded like a song we were singing just a moment ago. I'll know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. You see, the true gospel brings us together as one. It doesn't divide us. It brings us together as one without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. For it's been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him since you're going through the same struggle you saw I had 
and now here that I still have. When I think about the verse 27 that talks about us being one, being one together, one body, one mind, one heart, standing firm in one spirit, striving together, striving together as one for the faith. That reminds me of the United States of America. Do you know that on the first great seal of the United States of America, there was a Latin phrase called e pluribus unum. It's on a lot of coinage and currency as well, but it's a Latin phrase that means out of many, one. And that's what America is. That's the greatness of America, out of many, one. What will destroy us is when we continue to divide and try to separate into different groups against one another. The greatest example of this is the Olympics. When you watch the Olympics, it's amazing to me how almost every other country is represented by Olympic athletes by one ethnicity. But America has such a diverse group of athletes that shows the beauty and the diversity that is America. Our strength, our greatness is in our diversity. But the diversity has to become one in order to defend the gospel and to live out the gospel that Christ wants us to live. We don't live as different individuals. We live as one. That's why I love a multi-ethnic congregation because we represent what John saw in Revelation when he looked at heaven. Every kindred, every tongue, every tribe, every nation, they're all represented there. We won't get to heaven and have you know one street of gold for whites and one street of gold for blacks and one street of gold for Latinos and one street of gold for Asians and another for Indians. No, no. It's one family, one breath, one voice, one cry. Jesus is our savior. We do this thing together. Something happened to me yesterday that it literally, literally broke my heart. I, emotionally speaking. I was driving out of the church parking lot and this was so random and ironic at the same time that I actually saw this. Turning out of the student center parking lot and turning right on Hebron, driving in front of the church. I saw a man jogging down the sidewalk. This was yesterday. I saw him jogging. I saw his hand up in the air and I thought, oh man, look at that patriotic moment. He's fist bumping our flags. I pulled my phone out. And I got it right next to him and started video. And I wanted to video this patriotic moment. Only to see that he wasn't fist pumping our flags. He was flipping off our flags and spitting on them as he ran by. And I continued to film and I've got it on my phone. I continued to film. I got right up next to him. And he turned around. And he saw me with the most hateful look. And he flipped me off both hands. And my heart just broke. My heart broke because one, I don't know what is going on in his life. I don't pretend to know. But my heart broke because the very flags that he was spitting on and either the flags or this building that he was flipping off Men and women died. Many of you served this country and our military to defend the rights of people to do just that. You put your life at risk so that we would have freedoms that involve people making choices that offend anger and break the heart of others. Again, I don't know his story, I don't know his pain. I just know it saddened me to see that whatever's going on in our world today has created such an anger in him that he would do that. I didn't say anything. I didn't do anything. I kept on driving in case you're wondering. I know some of you are thinking what you would do. Well, let me give you from Philippians chapter one, six keys to stay positive in a negative world because I had to do this yesterday. I had to actually take these very principles and start acting out on them to find something positive in a very negative situation. Number one, you gotta remain thankful and grateful. 
This is what Paul said. I thank my God every time I remember you. You've got to remain thankful and grateful. Gratitude, as it turns out, is closely related with well-being and life satisfaction. Plenty of studies to show it. I don't have to go into all the reasons. You just need to know that if you choose gratitude and thankfulness over frustration and and envy and and jealousy, you're going to have a much, much better life. You're going to sleep better. You're going to eat better. You're going to have more patience, more happiness, better satisfaction in your relationships, better self-care. Everything will be better when you choose gratitude. Number two, you got to pray with joy. Verse four says, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Now this, I think, is easier done if you have a proper understanding of your heavenly father. See, maybe if you've had or have a earthly father that you couldn't approach with joy. Maybe you came to your father and he would never give you the time. He would push you away. He would make you feel like what you had to say wasn't important enough or didn't matter enough and never gave you the time of day. Then I understand how you might have a reason to not want to come to your heavenly father with joy. But if you had an earthly father that you could come to with joy, that you could hop up on his lap and he would welcome you. Hey, come on, come here, baby. Tell me what's going on. And would give you that kind of love and reception and acceptance. Then you would understand a relationship with a heavenly father better. When you understand that God loves you, he cares about you and that you can approach him with joy. It changes everything. It just changes everything. The third point is this. You got to stay confident in God's goodness. God is a good God. He cares about you. He's a kind and a caring God. If you feel like God is always out there to get you, that he's sitting on the throne with the lightning bolt, waiting to strike you when you do something wrong, then maybe you can't stay confident in his goodness. But if you believe that God is good, he's caring and he loves you, then you can believe that he's going to carry on what he started in your life. He's going to carry on good things, good plans that he has in store for you. Number four, you got to focus on the positive. Verse 12 and 14, I won't take time to read it, but it's the portion where Paul says what has happened to me has actually turned out for good. Everybody here knows that I'm here because of my commitment to Christ. And it's even emboldened other brothers and sisters to share the gospel of Jesus Christ even more because I'm in chains. So it's turned out for good. Whatever negative situation you find yourself in, you've got to find the positive. There's always something good that can come out of it. Yesterday, rather than focusing on the pain and the anger of one man, I focused on the sacrifices of many who made it possible for him to do what he was doing. And I was thankful and I was grateful for men and women who gave their lives for this country and who have served this country. You have to choose to focus on the positive. Number five, you got to remain unified and defend the gospel. That's kind of a heavy one. Maybe remain unified and defend the gospel. Let me explain what I mean by this. It's up to us as followers of Christ to defend this gospel. There's so many new terms that are coming out right now, so many new phrases. It's hard to keep up with what's socially acceptable and what's not. I mean, I'm talking about phrases like social justice and social liberation and activism and intersectionality, moral authority, being woke, you know, group identity, identity politics, critical theory, which is a phrase that I want to talk about just for a moment. Critical theory. I understand what it is. I didn't really know the meaning and the Uh, and the connection of the the name with the definition until recently, but it all connects to what we're facing today. So let's say you're in a conversation and someone says to you, well, since God cares about the oppressed, Christians should embrace critical theory or social justice because that's trying to eliminate oppression too. What do you say? Well, critical theory is the way that our culture tries to explain and confront power structures. And many Christians have embraced this as well. In other words, like Paul was trying to point out to the Philippians, there's a gospel that's being preached out of envy and rivalry, but there's another one preached out of love. You need to stick with this. Here's what's happening. To understand critical theory, you gotta understand its two main claims. And the first is this, that everybody can be divided into two groups, those who have power and those who don't. The second claim is those who have power always, always oppress those who don't. So two simple claims. Everybody can be divided into two groups, those who have power and those who don't. And those who have power always oppress those who don't. 
So how do we know who the oppressors are and who the oppressed are? Well, according to critical theory, oppressors and oppressed are based on your group identity. It's based on things like race, gender, religion, immigration status, income, sexual orientation. All of those things determine whether you're one of the oppressors or whether whether you're one of the oppressed. Now, someone could be part of one group in one way, part of another group in another way, but intersectionality comes in whenever you find yourselves in different groups or multi-layers of the oppressed or multi-layers of the oppressor. Intersectionality seeks to measure someone's level of oppression by how many groups they're identifying with. Here's an example. If you're a male minority, based on what our country defines as majority minority, if you're a male minority, whether it's black, Latino, Asian, Indian, you are less oppressed than a female minority. But the female minority is less oppressed than the female gay minority. It's like three different levels of oppression. In critical theory, the degree to which you are oppressed determines your level of moral authority. I want to make sure you get this. Your level of moral authority is determined by how many degrees of oppression are in your life. So here's what happens. Because our culture has thrown the word of God as the basis for moral authority out. Now we as Christians, we don't. This is our moral authority. But because the Bible's been thrown out of our schools, the Bible's been thrown out of you know, every facet of our culture today, there is no moral authority. There's no basis for what is right or wrong. So this is our culture's attempt to try to reinsert a basis for what is right and wrong because the Bible's no longer there. So who's right, who's wrong, and who has the authority to say so? Critical theory says that the ones who are more oppressed have more, a greater degree of moral authority. So as a result, the experience and the perspective of, let's say, a gay minority woman is more valuable than the experience and the perspective of, take, for example, a straight white male based on critical theories, definitions. In the same way, the more oppressed someone is, the less moral responsibility they have. And here's what I mean by that. That's why some groups can protest and break the law and be excused for their actions because they belong to a group that is oppressed. A group that would be considered part of the oppressors could do the same thing, but they would be prosecuted for it. They could break the same laws, but be prosecuted because they're part of either the group of oppressors or oppressed. Am I making sense to you? Those who aren't part, and this is very critical to understand too, those who are not part of the oppressed groups, you gain your moral authority, not you right here necessarily, but that person gains their moral authority by surrendering to those who have it, the oppressed. And that's called being woke. You're woke when you recognize that you are an oppressor And so you surrender your moral authority to the oppressed. And some people claim that since Jesus cares about oppression, critical theory and intersectionality should be embraced by Christians. But I want to say something to you. Just as Paul pointed out the difference between the gospel that was preached out of envy and rivalry and one that was preached out of love and unity, I want to tell you critical theory and Christianity are not consistent. And I want to give you three simple reasons why. They're not consistent, but in students especially, you're the ones getting bombarded with this. Critical theory and Christianity are not consistent because number one, critical theory offers a completely different view of humanity than Christianity does. Critical theory says that our value and our worth comes from like our DNA, our race, our gender, or what type of oppressive, oppressive groups you're a part of. Christianity doesn't say that. Christianity says we're all created equal. We're equally created. We're 
equally valuable, we're equally guilty of sin, equally deserving of punishment, but equally able to find grace and mercy through Jesus Christ. That's what Christianity says. Which leads to the second point. Critical theory says it has a completely different view of sin than Christianity does. The Bible defines sin as anything that violates God's design for people, including unjust oppression of other people. But critical theory defines sin only as oppression. So as a result, advocates of critical theory, they would see biblical practices that we exercise here, like discipleship, correction, leadership, reproof. They would define that as sinful assertions of power, especially if it's coming from somebody who is part of the oppressor group. But they would excuse sins like jealousy, anger, hatred, bitterness, and unforgiveness and envy if it's among the oppressed group. The Bible says we're all guilty of sin before God, regardless of our social status, regardless of our economic situation. And the Bible condemns oppression as one of, but certainly not the only way which humans rebel against God. But because critical theory gets the problem wrong, they also get the solution wrong, which leads to the third point. Critical theory offers a different view of salvation than Christianity. According to the Bible, because we're all guilty of sin, salvation can only be found through Jesus Christ, through repentance of our sins. Our only hope is being forgiven of our sins because critical theory teaches that oppressors are guilty and the oppressed are not. Salvation for the oppressed is not found through repentance. Salvation for the oppressed is found through social liberation here and now, through activism. In other words, critical theory has a completely different understanding of who we are, what the problem is, and how we can fix it rather than Christianity. So if you're told somebody, surely with good intentions, that we as Christians should embrace critical theory because Jesus cares about the oppressed, you got to remember these things. Critical, critical theory offers a different view of humanity, a different view of sin, and a different view of salvation. They are not consistent. Now, I share with you there are six keys to staying positive in a negative world. I share with you the first five. Number six is this, be saved by trusting in Jesus. That's what Paul told the Philippians. Verse 28, he said, this is a sign to them that will be destroyed, that you'll be saved and that by God. When we are saved, obviously salvation gives us an opportunity to live more positive than negative. You can rise above the negativity in this world when you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. So here's my appeal and my challenge to every single person in this room or those watching this service online today, that if you've allowed yourself, your value and your worth to be determined by the color of your skin, by the gender of your sexuality, you've allowed yourself to be defined how valuable, how valuable you, you are by the money that you have in your pocket or what country you were born in or what city you were born in, I challenge you to surrender that to Jesus Christ. When you surrender that to Jesus, he will give you a new identity, an identity that's found in Christ alone. You see, we are sons and daughters of God. We're, we're image bearers of Jesus Christ. That's who my identity is. I am found in Christ and Christ alone. I'm not here to promote my skin color. I'm not here to promote my male sexuality. I'm here to promote Jesus Christ because as a son and daughter of God, it makes me an heir and a joint heir with Christ Jesus. I'm here to live for Jesus. I'm here to follow Jesus. I'm here to follow his roadmap, his commands that he gives us in this word. We're here to follow Christ, not this culture. Doesn't always make you popular. Sometimes it makes you very unpopular. I get a lot of criticism for defending the gospel, but I will continue to defend the gospel. But we preach this gospel out of love for all humanity. We preach this gospel out of concern and compassion for everyone in the same way when Jesus said, he's not willing that any should perish. That has to be our heartbeat as well. We're not willing that one person would perish, but that all would come to repentance. And that's through surrendering to Jesus Christ. Don't let this world define you. 
Don't let this world tell you who you are and tell you whether you're oppressed or an oppressor. We, we, we die to all of that when we surrender our lives to Jesus. I, we, I will find my identity in Christ. I will find my identity in Christ alone. Can I get an amen? Do me a favor, stand to your feet all over this place. As you stand to your feet, I want you to bow your heads just for a moment. As you bow your heads, there are many across this room that in the next few moments, this is gonna be a life-changing moment for you. You've allowed this culture to define you and you've worn your identity like a badge. But you know what Jesus says? He says to bring that badge of whether it's a badge of your race, your sexuality, your income, the color of your skin, how smart you are, your degrees, your intellect, your accomplishments. You lay that crown down at the feet of Jesus. You say, Jesus, I surrender all. I surrender all. And when you rise back up, you rise back up as a son and daughter of the Most High God. Many of you are gonna do that as we're singing this final song today. You're gonna have an opportunity to make that surrender, to make that challenge, to accept that challenge and to say, Jesus, I surrender all to you. That's when you find your value. That's when you find your worth. And the color of your skin can't give it to you and it can't take it away. The accomplishments in this world can't give you your value and worth and it can't take it away. Jesus is the one who does that. Would you put your trust in Jesus? Say, Jesus, come into my heart, wash away my sin. Be the Lord of my life today and every day and he will do that and I'm challenging the rest of us all over this place whether you're in the service or watching online that as we're singing this song one breath one voice one cry Jesus our Savior that Jesus would become Savior across this land across our country and that we would see true revival birthed in this land in our day in our time let's make that our hearts cry now come on